readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Patrick Radden Keefe is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Say Nothing, which received the National Book Critics Award for Nonfiction and was selected as one of the 10 best books of 2019 by the New York Times Book Review, The Washington Post, and others. His latest book, Empire of Pain, is a grand, devastating portrait of three generations of the Sackler family, famed for their philanthropy, whose fortune was built by Valium and whose reputation was destroyed by Oxycontin. It's a portrait of the excess of America's second Gilded Age and a relentless investigation of the naked greed and indifference to human suffering that built one of the world's greatest fortunes. Now let's join Amy Brinker in conversation with author Patrick Radden Keefe. In 2017, you published your New Yorker article by a similar name of the book, um, detailing everything you had uncovered about the Sackler family um, and the opioid crisis up to that point. Um, And then in 2019, when you got a hold of the court filing documents for this Massachusetts Sackler case, uh, you kind of went through all those pages uh, and put it onto Twitter, like some of the biggest, uh, the biggest revelations. Can you, do you remember that, that, that time, like going through the files, did anything like, do you have a moment where you're just like, this is what can become a book? Like, this is worth digging into. This is confirming what I thought or surprising me hugely? Yeah, I, it was a very strange experience because I, when I worked on the article, a lot of what I had been curious about was what do the Sacklers say behind closed doors? Um, how do they talk about this? And they wouldn't talk with me for the piece. They wouldn't even give me a statement. And I interviewed people who knew the family, but I felt as though there was only so close I could get. And so what was so striking to me about reading that filing, I didn't read it right away. It's funny, it came out, there was a wave of press articles, and I read some of the press articles about the filing. And then it was maybe a week later, I thought, you know, I should really look at the original filing itself. Maybe there's some stuff in it that wasn't written about in the papers. And there was so much, and it was so rich. And it was the emails of members of the family talking about these issues. And you could immediately sense how how greedy they were. Frankly, I mean, you know how 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 much they were pushing um, the sales of these opioids, and then also how indifferent to the pretty disastrous consequences of their own actions, and so that was just so striking for me. Um, and there were little moments I remember even from that Twitter thread. It, it, there was one exchange between a couple of employees and there was a, there was a person who was in charge of compliance at the company. So the person whose job it is to make sure that the company behaves. And somebody mentioned something about Richard Sackler to him and he wrote back, LOL. And I just thought, what kind of company is this? When the internal watchdog is saying, LOL, uh, you know, kind of throwing his hands up in the air and saying, not much I can do about this. And, and that just struck me as so intriguing that I, I thought there was probably a book in it. Yeah, and, and I think like one of the things, when I was reading the book with an eye to interviewing you, the thing that I couldn't wrap my head around was how much obfuscation there was and how much privacy is like part and parcel of the Sackler family. Uh, so how, I'm, I'm kind of imagining like, you know, a beautiful mind bulletin board with like thread and, pa- and papers and all that kind of stuff. But how did you even begin to wrap your arms around this kind of stuff? How did you start? I started in a sort of a two track way. One was talking to as many people as I could. And I wanted to find people who knew the family. I wanted to find people who had worked for the company. 
I wanted to get as close as I could. If they weren't going to talk to me, then I wanted to get as close as I could in terms of talking to people who knew them. So that was one side, was the making phone calls and seeking people out side of it. And actually, because I knew that that a lot of the book would take place in the 1950s, um, I was really racing to talk to some people before they died. I mean, there were, there were some people who I sought out who died before I could speak with them. Um, so there was a phase where I was, I was talking to a lot of very old people. Um, and then in parallel to that it was a, a lot of hunting through documents. And so some of that was court documents. Some of that was internal documents that were leaked to me. A lot of that was archival material. Um, so I was looking for letters, for instance, that this, the original Sackler brothers wrote, and they would, wouldn't have donated their papers to any library, but it turns out they have a lot of friends who did that. So I was going through a lot of archives and, and libraries, and there were these amazing kind of quite intimate moments, you know, where I was, you have this family that won't talk to me, but, but I'm looking at birth announcements and bar mitzvah invitations and uh, wedding announcements, you know, the, these, these quite intimate moments from their lives. When there's a great moment, there's a great line um, early on that says the Sackler family or the Sackler empire is a completely inter- integrated operation. Can you give like a broad outline from the early days, like the foundational business ties and stuff? What, where were those tentacles? Like how, what were the main outlines to that large operation. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Arthur Sackler, who was the sort of the original patriarch of the family, he had this amazing personal quality where he always, he never wanted to choose. He always wanted both, everything. And you saw it in his personal life where he had these kind of overlapping relationships with these three different women. Um, and in his professional life, he, he liked to straddle these different spheres. So he was a physician, but he also had a medical advertising firm, which advertised pharmaceuticals. And he bought a pharmaceutical company for his brothers, which they ran, that he had a stake in. And he started a medical newspaper that was given away for free to doctors and subsidized by pharmaceutical advertising. And so there was this sense in which he was trying to marry medicine and commerce in ways that at at the time felt innovative and probably to him, at least at first, quite harmless. But I think that we, we see the seeds of that in the 1950s, and I think that by the time you fast forward to the 1990s, um, it's kind of shocking the extent to which the commerce side of things has hijacked the medicine side. I was actually shocked by um, an archival advertisement or something that you had mentioned early on, talking about advertising heroin as a, um, as a medicine, you know, before that was... Uh, I <laughs> realized how dangerous that was, but it, but even then in, oh, I can't remember the fifties, the forties, um, earlier, yeah. earlier, um, downplaying the addictive quality, even then, which was just such a through line throughout the book. Yeah. I mean, I think that this was, you know, Ar- Arthur didn't invent this phenomenon, but he, but he was, um, he really excelled at it. He was kind of a maestro when it came to overplaying the therapeutic benefits of any given drug and and underplaying the side effects and the and the and the um you know the potentially addictive qualities yeah you know um <laughs> that if you have any european friends i feel like all the, they'll always bring up somehow how mortifying and horrifying it is that we advertise our drugs um so was there anything that shocked you that when you were doing this like you're used to that. You're used to the advertising of drugs. Like what, 
where do you think it took like a hard left turn? Well, so it's interesting. There is this phenomenon in our country where um, big pharma companies market directly to consumers. And I thought it was hilarious uh, not too long ago when there was the big Oprah interview with Meghan and Harry. And um, on Twitter, there were all of these British people who were watching it. And... And they and they saw the ads that Americans are routinely subjected to, and they were completely appalled. And there were these hilarious Twitter threads where they were saying, "Oh my God, you know, Amer- Americans have to watch this stuff. This is barbaric." Um, so there's that side of things. But what was so striking to me was that um, Arthur Sackler, and then later his nephew Richard Sackler. Um, perfected the art of marketing not to the consumer, but to physicians. And that, I think, was what I found most unsettling, because when you go to the doctor, I think there is a tendency to want to put your health and safety in their hands and trust that they are kind of beyond influence, Um, and interestingly enough, that's an image that the Sacklers, generations of the Sacklers have always promoted, the idea of doctors as unimpeachable. And, And it turns out that's just a big con. And so I was really shocked. I have to give you an example. I've talked to doctor friends who say, oh, of course, pharma companies are always trying to influence us, but I would never be influenced by that sort of thing. And Arthur Sackler used to say, you know, doctors wouldn't be influenced by advertising. Of course, you remember, he ran a firm which specialized in advertising to doctors. Um, and, And my doctor friends would say, oh, you know, just because a pharma company buys me a steak dinner, that would never change the way I prescribe. So it turns out that Purdue Pharma some years would spend as much as $9 million just buying food for doctors. And they so carefully went over those numbers, they knew they were getting a return on investment on every dollar they spent. So, yeah, I think that's the, that's the gruesome part is how, how closely they kept track of everything they were doing. Like there's very little there's very little like like to stand on to say that they couldn't have known like which you made pretty abundantly clear um throughout the book um when you were talking to you spoke to something like 200 sources right like a ton of people um how did you i guess like how did you weigh what they were saying and like how did you prioritize the people you were speaking to and um yeah, I guess like did it did it did any one person stand out to you as like changing how you thought about the book or the family? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I tend to like to do a lot of interviews for a bunch of reasons, in part because I'm always looking for stories and I really like to corroborate things as best I can, find as many people who are around. Um, You know, there was an instance in which there was a great line that somebody told me that they heard in a meeting and it sounded almost too good to be true. And then I found somebody else who was in the meeting and heard the same line. Um, So I I find that um, it's helpful to just ground the reporting I'm also always looking for characters. I'm looking for people who are interesting and kind of fit into the story in interesting ways. Um, if I if I had to pick one, I'd throw out um, Richard Caput, who was Richard Sackler's college roommate. And um, Richard Caput actually found me. I didn't find him. He reached out to me after he read my New Yorker article. Um, and he was a revelation for me because there 
are a series of personality traits that Richard Sackler has that I think when you see them in the context of OxyContin and Purdue Pharma, they seem quite malevolent. Um, and what was fascinating about Richard Caput is that he described those same traits in the guy he met as a college sophomore. And they were quite charismatic, uh, almost magnetic, exciting traits in, in a young man who, where, this, where the stakes were much lower. You know, the idea of somebody who's just ha pursues his passions with a headlong enthusiasm, a kind of blind enthusiasm. Um, it, when you're 20 years old, it's really fun to spend time with somebody like that. It's seductive and exciting. Um, and, and to me, that felt as though there was a kind of novelistic depth to the character. I, I understood Richard. Um, and in some ways, I was sympathetic to him in, in ways that I uh, couldn't have been necessarily prior to to spending time with Richard Caput. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because, um, you know, there's so much horrible things that have happened and they come, you know, not everything has come from malice, even though there's horrifying, horrifying, true, yeah. true evil. And like, you know, certain seeds were like, this could help people. And certain seeds were like, this is an interesting direction. Uh, and then it took some pretty twisty, awful devastating turns. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you, you say that because I think it's important and um, and as, as anybody who reads the book can probably gather, I find a lot of the defenses that the Sacklers put out pretty unpersuasive. But I also, I also don't believe that they set out to kill a lot of people. Um, and so, and for me, the um, that's part of what makes this so tragic is that the... Um, in some ways, this is a story about idealism and, and a kind of idealistic bet that turned out to be a bad bet. <laughs> and, and, the, and the denial and the stubbornness um, that prevented this family and their company from coming to terms with the mistake they made early on and recalibrating their behavior. Yeah, and even just uh, Arthur Sackler's just breadth and energy like it's it's boggling and impressive like whether or not everything he did was good it was not but it, it is impressive no matter what yeah. it was wild to read about just the 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 juggling the unbelievable amount of balls yeah. in the air <laughs> totally yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but, um were there any other, uh, you know, you couldn't get a hold of the Sacklers, you couldn't get a, um, a statement out of them. Were there other dead ends besides just not getting them to talk? Like, did you run down any rabbit, rabbit trails that just didn't, just didn't pan out? Oh, there were so many. I mean, I, um, the, a big one that was really painful was I made this discovery about Bobby Sackler, um, a second generation Sackler who killed himself in 1975. And I really, really, really wanted to find out more about his life, but it was very hard. And this was mostly during the pandemic. I was trying to do that reporting and I just hit a bunch of dead ends and a lot of institutions that might've had files were just closed and totally inaccessible. And, you know, I was able to ascertain that, there were police detectives who showed up on the day that he killed himself and that they would have had files. And I got somebody at NYPD to seek out the files, the kind of detectives report. And it turns out that they had been in this one particular warehouse that was flooded during Sandy and, you know, months of reporting. Um, and then you, it turns out that the files you've been seeking, um, you know, were, were irretrievably damaged. So there was that sort of thing. There were a lot of COVID related things where there are, I mean, to this day, there are specific letters that I know are in certain archives and I know the box number and I know the folder number. Oh, uh, and I can't, and I can't get in. And I've, you know, I went, there were periods of time where I was trying to, you know, I was trying to find some 
Is there some custodian I can bribe? I mean, is there is there is there is there anybody who has access um, to these locked down facilities? And I was never able to put my hands on them. I, I you know I don't think any of this really matters all that much to people reading the book, but of course for me, it uh, it continues to. Um, to fester as a frustration. Do you have, I mean, are you so done? Are you so done with this story? Or once you could access them, do you have any interest in tracking them down? I do have interest in tracking them down. I mean, it's funny, this thing always happens where now the book is out and I've, I've heard from lots and lots of people just in the last three weeks who worked at Purdue or who know the Sacklers um, with all kinds of interesting leads. And I, I kind of have two impulses. I, on the one hand, I just, I'm ready to move on. I feel like I've told the story I wanted to tell. Um, on the other hand, I'm always curious. So, um, yeah, I think probably when those, when those letters, uh, become available, I will, I'll want to see what they say. Well, your, your last book, Say Nothing, and this book are just two groups that have kind of like baked in silence to their entire deals. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you, when you were doing your research, like I know that part of it was chasing down older folks and I'm sure that was the same for Say Nothing, but were there any other, you know, clear similarities or in writing those two books? There were, I, I think in some ways they were very, very different. Um, for me, it was there are these there are formal similarities. I, I wanted to tell the stories in a very similar way. Um, so there are reporting challenges. In, you know, in both cases, really, say nothing. There's four major characters, and and one of them wouldn't talk with me, and three of them were dead. Um, and with the Sacklers, they they completely froze me out, and and none would talk. So, and then in terms of the type of writing that I like to do. Um, I want it to feel as, as vivid and immediate and absorbing as possible. I don't want you to feel as though these people are very remote. I think if I'm, if I'm doing my job, you should, the reader should almost forget along the way that I didn't have access to these people. Um, and so that's just a huge reporting challenge in terms of gathering enough concrete detail, trying to get a sense of the way people's voices sound, the way they talk, the way they think. Um, and so the writing challenges were, were actually quite similar in some ways. Um, but there are also really major differences. I mean, for me, Say Nothing was very much a story of moral ambiguity. Um, I, I think that there's part of what I was trying to do with that book was show that there's the narrative of the troubles has been caricatured in you know in one direction or another depending on your point of view um and i was hoping to get close enough to these people that i would just complicate any preconceptions you had about them um and with the sacklers it's i i feel a great deal of moral clarity i mean i the um I, which, which, but, but again, I don't, I didn't want to caricature them. I mean, I want to try and understand how they did what, what to me is seem in some cases to be quite monstrous things. Well, it's also, it's like systematically you show the, um, the environment in which they were able to do those things too. Like there's, there's other forces and there's, you know, the trend of pain management growing at the same time. And they were lucky in many ways too. Yeah. And the, and the whole system, I mean, you know, in some ways the, the, it's a book about um, the way in which certainly in the U S our, um, our capitalist system and our system of government and our system of justice, I think tend to insulate the super elite from the negative consequences of their own decisions. I mean, actually, now that, now that you mention it, there's another thing, to, there's another parallel between the two books, which is just that they're both about, they're both about the stories that people tell themselves and tell the world about the, the transgressive things they've done. 
You know, they're both they're both about they're both about narrative construction and drinking your own Kool Aid too. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's really interesting. Um, well, I guess one last question is, you know, we talked about those heartbreaking dead ends, but is there any one moment that you're just so, so glad you could include in the book, something you're really proud you got? Proud is probably the wrong word, but there was a moment that happened very, very late in the game. I think it happened, I think it might've happened in January. Uh, so it was, it was basically, I had basically already been told pencils down by, by my editor, but I had been for a year dialing into bankruptcy hearings because Purdue Pharma was in bankruptcy. And these hearings were long and often very dull. And there were all these bankruptcy lawyers and this judge. And they would always, many of them would make these little kind of, um, they would give these little speeches about how, of course, we're all thinking about the victims of the opioid crisis. That's why we're all here, you know, billing $1,000 an hour. And it always felt like this strange disconnect to me. It felt very palpably uncomfortable because I felt as though um, the fate of Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers was going to get decided in this bankruptcy court. And everything was very sterile and antiseptic and lawyers talking to lawyers. And it felt very out of touch with... um, the reality of the consequences of the, of the opioid crisis. And there was this moment in a hearing where people started calling in. Um, and because it was a dial in, so anybody could call in and these victims started calling in and break, trying to break into the proceedings. And the judge basically told them, you know, we don't want to hear from you, like get off the line. And, to me, it was it was heartbreaking, but also very profound in the sense that I had had this feeling that I couldn't really articulate about what was wrong with these hearings. And then you suddenly have this incredibly vivid illustration in the form of these people who, you know, a guy saying, I'm, I'm you know, I wanted to speak with you because my fiance died. Um, and then for the judge to say in a very kind of jargony way, I'm sorry that that issue is not calendared for this hearing. You know, we won't be hearing from you, sir. Um, just felt like a very apt illustration. It, it kind of put, it, it sort of expressed in a scene what I was struggling to to say in an editorial way. Absolutely. Um, well, great. I mean. These are some some wonderful answers. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. I I hope it helps. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.